Yeah, welcome again uh, to our yet another exciting session. And we have here Beep with us, telling us about the road for reliable automated test. And this is a burning topic, at least for me, uh, when we all have uh, uncertain, unreliable tests uh, in the suit and flakiness all everywhere. And so Beep, uh, this, she is head of QA in Bloom, Bloom Group, and uh, she has been actively participating in Git uh, open source libraries, their uh, other uh, blogs that she has and other comics also series yeah Pip. so yeah so you can follow i can pass the link uh, in chat and uh, so over to you thank you so much for the introduction hello everyone good morning if uh, it's morning like this for me right now uh thank you for joining um would really be interested to see where you're all coming from so if you can just type something in the chat just for me to see that you're awake yeah I'm uh, here in Romania. It's a kind of a cloudy day, so I hope the thunderstorm will not uh, have any impact on our talk. But uh, anyway, I will start sharing the screen because I have a very nice picture to show you. Wait for it. Let's see. So here we are. So I've seen that people have already started writing. Oh, wow. So many interesting locations. Thank you for joining from everywhere, basically. Um, and let me get into the reason we're actually here, right? So reliable automation and what I have to say about this. So first of all, you know, I'm Corina, if you don't know me yet. Um, I've been doing automation for the past 10 years now, probably, I guess. Um, I've done mostly, um, one second, can I? Oops, no, 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 no. There we go. So I've done mostly automation with Selenium throughout my career, but I'm also involved in the backend part, uh, also some mobile testing and so on. But the, the biggest chunk of, of my work is uh, actually focused on Selenium. And today I'm going to talk to you about uh, talk to you about automated tests in general. But because of course we're at Selenium Conf, I'm going to refer a little bit to some scenarios that uh, we encounter when we're doing Selenium testing. So. I want to give you my tips and tricks on how to achieve reliable automation, uh, automation that you can actually count on, automated tests that you can run and that you can uh, be certain that are properly validating the feature that you're testing. And of course, I want to start out with discussing a little bit what I mean by reliable tests. So this is not per se a definition because we don't really have a definition for this, but you know, our, our instinct tells us that a reliable test is one we can count on so that every time we run it, if the software that we're testing hasn't changed from the previous run, the result of the test will be the same. So if there is no bug in the system and if no new deployments of the software we're testing were done, then our test is supposed to pass. However, if we encounter things such as random failures, whenever we are running the same test and nothing changed in the infrastructure, then we're talking about a test that needs to be addressed, a test that is unreliable and that we cannot count on to validate our product. Another case of unreliability comes from not properly writing the code. Uh, I will see, I will, I will show you some, some examples what I mean by this. But uh, one of the most frequent situations when our tests are not reliable is when they are reporting false positives or false negatives, right? So maybe you don't even realize you think your test is going to pick up on a bug, but in fact, it will never pick up any sort of bug because of the way it was written. So we, we will see some examples there. But what is our end goal when we're doing automation? So what we want is not to create just an automated test. We don't just want to write another test to add to our repos. We want to write tests that are reliable, uh, that we know for a fact do not require any more updates in the future. Uh, we want a test that once we edit, uh, a test that which is once added to the, let's say, CI or CD pipelines, they can run there every single day and they can, they can continuously validate the software that we're working on. So in order to achieve such a reliable uh, automated test or to, to, to create such a reliable automated test, we need to do it properly from the start. So whenever we are starting, starting working on our automation, we need to make sure that by the time we finish that piece of work, it is the 
best version of it that we can come up with. We shouldn't do something like, okay, I'm just going to write a test right now. Okay, I know it fails here and there, but I'm just going to tweak it sometime in the future because it's never going to come up again. You know, so uh, we've probably seen if we're working in sprints that, you know, once we consider a task done, it's really difficult to come back and uh, modify, you know, the, the tests we created as part of that task because there's never any time. There's always new priorities coming in. There's always new features we are working on. So those tests that we worked on initially will probably not be revised in a very long time unless we have like a really good reason to, to address them. So having said that, when we start working on the test, let's make sure we're creating the best version of the test. Let's make sure we set uh, enough time aside to write it the way it's going to actually help us validate the software that we're testing. Because in the end, why are we creating automation? We are currently developing a new feature. We want to test it in a certain way, right? We create automation to test that particular feature. Now, once the feature goes into production, we don't want to have to manually revisit it every time we're doing a deployment that might impact that particular feature. We don't want to, to test it manually every single release. So having an automated test that can cover this part for us can help us very much. We don't, even, we don't even need to bother about the feature. We don't even need to remember about it. We just have our automation and it's going to do the checks for us as long as the automation, as I said, is reliable. If it's not, then it's, you will need to invest time and you will have to look into, first of all, the feature that you're testing to make sure that it's working properly. And secondly, into the test, to see why is it failing, right? So maybe it was failing randomly and you just needed a bit of tweaking, but if you didn't tweak it from the, the start, as I said, it will be difficult to tweak it sometime along the way. So in order to create the automation for the feature that you're working on, you know, usually when you're creating a new soft piece of software or when the developers are doing that, there is an attached, let's say, Jira user story or Jira epic, right? There's always a ticket to which developers assign their tasks. Similarly to the developers, us, the QAs, can also assign um, automation time by creating our own dedicated tickets. And we can only consider, or we should only consider the entire feature as done when the automation tickets are fully done and closed and validated. Uh, so when we are happy, and we consider that the tests have properly been implemented. Uh, hey, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you there. Are you changing yes. your slide because uh, we can uh, no. see? Again. No, not right? yet. Right. Not yeah. yet. But thank you for the, yeah, not yet. Please continue. Yes. Sorry. yes. So um, let's say, okay, we have now created the automation. We now have the reliable test that we, we've dreamed of. Does that mean we will never ever have to update it ever again? Well, not really. Sometimes we will still need to do maintenance on that test because as we know, features might change in time. So if let's say we've implemented a feature today, we have validated it for six months, we run the tests, but after six months, something changes in the requirement. Of course, that means there will be an attached, again, Jira ticket that will uh, um, have um, you know, the requirements of what we need to implement, but it also will have the de dedicated uh, development tasks assigned uh, to the developers. Similarly, because the software is going to change, and of course our tests will now fail, we need to assign a QA task to the same ticket in order to update our tests so that the tests reflect the fact that the software has changed, right? So whenever the change, change is done to the software, uh, automatically we need to add a QA task for that. Uh, I know that sometimes people say, okay, um, we created a test, but the test is failing because the software has changed and the test is flaky because of that. That's not really correct. If the software changes, it's obvious that the test is supposed to fail. So it's obvious that the test also needs to change to reflect uh, what the new implementations on the feature uh, have, you know, what the impact of the, the, the new implementation uh, has done to the test. So in order to, to update the tests, again, QA tasks should be added to the same ticket where the development work is, uh, uh, is uh, created. Um, big changes to code 
should be viewed as new functionality in general. So if it's something like only a label change, that's just a minor tweak, right? But if there's something in the logic of the feature that we were testing that is changing, then definitely this is like new functionality and it's obvious that we need to have a QA task assigned to that. So don't be shy in, in creating these tasks whenever you see that the features have changed and that you need to update your tests. I would say update the tests. Some people say you need to fix the tests. And from my perspective, it's not really okay to say that you need to fix the tests because the tests, tests are not wrong, right? When you created the tests, they were testing a certain feature. When the feature has changed, your tests are going to fail, obviously, because they detected that something has changed. So you don't need to fix them. You just need to update them together with uh, the code of the product that was updated. So I hope that makes a little, a little, a little sense. And let's actually start you know, creating some automation. And where are we going to start? Well, the first thing we need to consider is to follow best practices when we are creating our automation, especially if we are uh, working with programming languages. Because you know, if you have some tools that are autom uh, automatically generating your code for you based on some drag and drops in the UI, that's a different story. But when you are creating the automation code, you need to create it considering coding best practices. Otherwise, um, whenever, let's say, a feature is changing for which you have already created a test, sometimes it, must be, uh, it might be very, very difficult to actually update the test. I can give you an example of something that happened in, in my case. Um, so we were testing a feature which was quite large. Uh, our tests that were created well before I joined the project were something like copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. So there were like maybe 20 tests with the same pattern and only a few things were different, like certain values that were passed in or there was some additional step here, additional step there and so on. So it was, there was little difference between the actual uh, steps that were taken by all of these, let's say 20 tests. When it came time to actually update the code, um, I spent probably three days trying to up update them. And I realized it's way too complicated to update them because uh, it, they were really difficult to understand and to read. You didn't really know where you had to make these changes because um, there were a lot of steps. There were like a gazillion steps. So in order to introduce the new changes, it was really difficult to pinpoint exactly where in the code you needed to, to make the changes. So after three days, I decided, you know what? Uh, I'm going to rewrite this from scratch. I'm going to use a different approach. I'm going to use better coding practices. And it actually was less time consuming to create the new tests than to update the old ones. So this is, this is a clear example where copy paste was used, but instead, you know, a basic thing like, you know, instruct, uh, uh, extracting, repeating code into methods could have been used instead. And this would have made it much easier to update all the chunks of the tests that we had. So this is just an example with methods, but of course, think about, for example, multi, um, multiple ifs that you might have in your code, like an if in an if in an else in an if and so on and so on. When you have such complicated code, uh, that's not the best practice and it's not really readable. So you need to consider coding best practices whenever you're doing your automation. Okay, this is the first thing you need to consider. And always try to keep the code as simple as possible, you know, not just for readability purposes, which is of course one of the biggest parts, but as I said, for, for having that option to change code, right? To, uh, to be able to change the code easily if you have to. Don't write a ton of code for a simple task, you know? Um, I know we are very passionate about writing code as testers. And if we see that we need to implement a task for testing, uh, we might think about something very complex and, you know, a lot of code because we love to write a lot of code. But in some cases, or in most cases, less code is better. So if you find that you can make um, use of some existing code from either the same project or from an external library that you can use, instead of you writing a whole, whole very complicated logic, just do that. Use that existing code instead of trying to create like a monster of, of code. There is no need to do that. Uh, simple tasks require just a little bit of code. Um, and when you have just, you know, small, uh, how should I say, less code, right? Less units of code. It's much easier to pinpoint failures when they occur. 
keep in mind that, for example, if you have a failure, which is not very difficult to, to understand where it's coming from, you might need to do debugging. And when you're doing debugging, if the code is very complex, you have no idea you know, what branch of the that complicated if structure you're on or what values you're currently using for your value variables that have changed in so many places uh, above the, the current line and so on. So less is better because it's easier to read, it's easier to understand, and it's easier to, to debug. It's very important to, to look at the test and for the test to just tell you easily what it's doing, right? You can easily figure out, oh, okay, this test is you know, performing this particular scenario. That test is performing that particular scenario and so on and so on. Um, regarding this, I have like a, a few tips, um, like always name your test classes to reflect what they, the, the tests inside the classes will, uh, will, um, will test, right? So kind of reflect the scenarios that will be found in that particular class. And of course, each test method or function, depending on your language, should also reflect the scenario that they are testing. So the naming should be as uh, clear as possible, as clear. And sometimes, yeah, it's a bit longer, but just make sure that from the, the method name, you can understand what the, the test is going to do so that what you, when you want to find a particular test, you know exactly uh, where to look for it. And when you're writing your code, your automation code, your test should focus only on the requirements, right? We have seen a lot of uh, reliability issues with our tests because of our environments uh, on which we run the tests. Sometimes environments are slow. Sometimes they, you know, they have all kinds of sync issues between different services that are running there. But your test shouldn't really care about that. Your test should focus on what it's supposed to test, namely the feature. And the feature is obviously reflected in the requirements. Your test should only have those steps that reflect the requirements or the test scenario that you, you're trying to test. If you have environment issues or if you have lack of testability, for example, you don't have, let's say, IDs on your page and uh, without the IDs, the selectors are really difficult to, to identify, you can address this separately by you know, talking to the people who are dealing with the environment or who are implementing your code for them to add testability. You shouldn't have anything like um, dedicated lines of code that say, okay, if I'm on this environment, perform these steps. Or if you're on that environment, you need to have a certain timeout because here each request takes three minutes, for example. That, that's, that's a bad approach. So focus on the tests and anything that's outside of the scope of the test, like environments or testability, address them separately so that your test can run smooth on every environment and so that the test doesn't know anything about the environment. Your test should be like environment agnostic. They should not know anything about such stuff, about infrastructure or any other, other things that are not related to the actual requirements. Of course, um, coming back a bit to Selenium, uh, when we have such things as environment issues, where uh, the environment is slow, well, surprise, if you haven't heard me talk about this, I'm going to recommend you use WebDriver Waits or methods based on WebDriver web Waits that can help you um, kind of wait for a little bit uh, before considering every action done or before starting an action so that you add more um, reliability in, in your tests. That's like the only thing I recommend to to add to the test, which is kind of, let's say, trying to fix an issue in the environment, right? Making sure you're waiting for the amount of, the proper amount of time before interacting with the page so that you don't, you, you don't have test, tests that fail simply because, oh, I should have waited one more second before clicking on a certain button. But if you see that you, you have web driver waits whose waiting time is of three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes for a single request or a single action, then that's not the case. That, that's not a good approach. So you don't, you shouldn't have, you know, a timeout of eight minutes to wait for the click of the button to generate the request to uh, the backend service or for a page to be to be loaded. That's way too much. So that there, you clearly have an issue with the environment, and that is where you have to talk to the people who are actually managing the environment in order to fix that issue, right? And again, if you haven't heard me talk about web driver waits. I'll be on Hangouts afterwards. We can chat about it. I've been talking about this for years. And for me, 
this is one of the key points where uh, you can make your sel selenium tests reliable. So what I do in my tests is I don't really use directly the methods from selenium, like click or send keys, but instead I have my own custom with methods, which um, help with different you know, exceptions that might occur when I'm trying to click or that, for example, for send keys, are also doing a clear of the field before I type into the field and which are also checking that what I typed into the field is um, still there when I exit the field. So when I switch focus, because, you know, we have JavaScript these days, which might influence um, the behavior of our fields. So using these uh, custom weights that deal with all of these steps for a simple task like send keys, for example, can help with the reliability of uh, the test. So yeah, we can discuss this uh, afterwards in the Hangout. Now, a very important thing for me when I write tests, well, first of all, is to have short tests, right? Uh, the shorter the test, the better it uh, is from the perspective of debugging it. And uh, it sh from the, the perspective of, write, um, of running it independently, I shouldn't have a test which has 100 lines of code, right? The test should be small. It helps with debugging, first of all. And uh, it helps with, you know, just understanding what the test is doing, because if it has, like, as I said, 100 steps, you don't know what the test is all about. And you don't know if all of those steps are really required in order to get to the end of the test. Maybe you're just doing too much in a test. Consider that. But uh, what I like to do is to write the tests in small chunks. So if I have, like, let's say, 12 steps in the test, right? Um, Let's say I have three pages that uh, the test is covering, right? So those 12 tests, uh, uh, sorry, those 12 steps get you through three different pages. Now, I would probably focus first on writing those steps for the first page. And once I'm finished with that, running the test again and again and again. And if there is any issue with the code I wrote, this is just a little bit of code. So it's easier to pinpoint if there is any random failure here or just any random fa uh, or any failure whatsoever, right? So by running uh, these small uh, chunks of code, I can easily identify the issues in these chunks of code. After I'm happy that the, the test is reliable, what I wrote until here, um, I can just move on and add more chunks uh, of code, rerun anything again. And this time when I'm rerunning uh, re the same test, um, in theory, at least, if I did a good job the first time, uh, any possible failures should only be in the latest chunk of code that I added, right? So by rerunning the test multiple times, first of all, I'm revalidating the initial code that I wrote, so the first uh, the, the code for the first page, but then I'm also properly validating the code for the second page. Multiple runs means more reliability because I know for a fact that I have run the test so many times that if there was some issue, I could have picked it up while I was running uh, these uh, smaller chunks, right? So this way, uh, I will just add more chunks, more chunks, more chunks, rerun, 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 fix, 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 if there is something to fix. And by the time I'm done with the test, I have more confidence that the test itself is going to be reliable because I tested it a lot. So I reran it and reran it and addressed any issue that I saw while I was uh, running the test. So by the time I committed to the repo, it has already been, let's say, tested by me. So the test was tested uh, while I was uh, running it and fixing it. And don't forget a very important thing. If you want your test to be reliable, you need to add checks. I know it might seem obvious that we need checks, but I did see quite a few tests throughout my career that didn't have any sort of check in place. Especially because we have Selenium, sometimes people just uh, expect that everything was going fine if we didn't see any Selenium exception, right? So if we try to click on something and there was no exception, it means it was successful. That's true, it was successful, but we need to also check what happened after we clicked that particular button. So for example, if you have a form where you have 10 fields that you need to fill in and you need to submit the page. Okay, you filled in the page, you clicked submit. That was perfect, submit worked. Something happened, there was no exception. The button was there, uh, it wasn't stale or anything. So everything was fine. 
However, let's say that out of those 10 fields for one, we didn't input the correct data. Hitting submit didn't do anything. It didn't submit the actual page. It just you know, made a call to the backend and the backend said, hey, that field is not okay, do something about it. You know, So in this case, without having a check that says, okay, now I got the success mes message or I got some sort of confirmation that the page was submitted successfully, my test is going to pass even though it shouldn't have passed because we didn't actually do what we wanted, right? So make sure every time you're doing an action, you're checking the response of that action or the behavior generated by that action. Don't just rely on Selenium to tell you, okay, something happened because Selenium can only, um, you know, show you exceptions if you were trying to interact with something that wasn't uh, in the right state when you try to do so. For example, it wasn't there or it was stale or any other such exceptions. Checking can be done in two ways. You can use assertions if you want to. I prefer to use weights. As I discussed earlier about web driver weights, for example, let's say uh, we want to make sure that there is a success message on a screen. We know in which web element we want that success message to be. We know the text for it. So, you know, the classic uh, approach would be to just call an assertion and say assert equals get text of that element is the expected text. However, uh, because again, we might have JavaScript and other things going on, by the time the assertion runs, uh, it may be a bit too fast. So it, we should have maybe waited for like 30 seconds more in order to call the assertion. However, if we have a wait method that says, wait for the element text to be this particular one, then you are kind of making sure that uh, the test is going to pass because you're actually going to wait for the success message to be there. Submission, on, on a submission of a page can take a few seconds. It can be very fast, but it can also take a lot of uh, time, especially in a test environment. By not waiting for the success message to uh, happen, you might cut it too short, right? So you, can, you, you, you might do the assertion too fast. The test would fail, even though, you know, maybe the success message was going to be displayed, but just not right then when the assertion happened. So waiting for the activity uh, to, to, to the result of the activity rather than doing the assertion on it uh, adds more reliability into your test. So you're not going to fail it right away, especially in those cases where you should have just waited a little bit more. So weights make sense uh, in this particular case. So um, when we run our tests, it's a good idea to run them as much as we can, right? But uh, you know we have a lot of tests to run and usually we put them in a CI CD pipeline. However, it's a very good idea for us to actually look at the tests while they are running. Especially because we're talking about Selenium, um, we have the option to see what is going on. When the test is running, we have the access to the browser. It's a good idea to look at a few test runs just to see what is going on. Because in some cases, for example, even though we're waiting for the success message to appear, an error might also be displayed. By looking at the browser, we can actually see that the error was present there. Okay, so <coughs> sorry. make sure you're looking at the test a few times just to make sure that you don't encounter anything you didn't expect. <coughs> sorry. If you see anything that you didn't expect, add a check for it so that the next time that thing happens, you can actually catch it with uh, one of your checks and then uh, you can report this as a bug if it is a bug, okay? I hope this makes sense. And of course, you can visually inspect the test while running them on your machine or if you run them remote, you can you know, access that machine and you can look at the browser instance on that machine to see what was going on. Now, another reason why the tests might pass or fail, um, um, so let's put it in another way. Whenever your test is created and you, you've set your checks in place, you need to make sure that they are the right checks. If they are not the right checks, that is going to give you some uh, false positives. So every time you create the test, you know, run the test under nor normal circumstances. You know, you expect your test to pass, they pass. But update the expected results just to see that the test is failing so that, you know, it doesn't uh, pass no matter what values are, are uh, present on the page or whatever uh, values you provided to the expected results, right? For example, if you expect, let's say, three web elements to be on the page, you have your check, it passes. 
if you update the code for uh, to to expect five elements, make sure it uh, fails if indeed on the page there were three. This is just a basic example, but usually if there's some more complex logic involved here, you might like try catches, for example. This is a very good example. Um, handling the try catches in a certain way might lead to having your test pass all the time, no matter what is going on on the page, right? So this is why I'm saying try to update the expected results just to see uh, that how the test is behaving when you have done that. Look out for the false positives because this is very, very important. You don't want a test to just pass no matter what is going on, right? There are two large situations or two large um, causes for false positives, try catches and if and elses. So whenever you're writing a try catch, make sure you're addressing both cases both the try and the catch. Make sure you think about what happens if the try happens uh, and make sure what happens when the try doesn't happen. Also, the catch is the same, right? So address both of these branches in a proper way so that, you know, um, for example, you have the try and you have catch all exceptions. Sometimes you just, you just catch exception and that's it. Exception is the mother of all exceptions in Java, right? Uh, let's say your code is supposed to only throw a particular exception. You have the catch. If that particular exception was caught, you are doing what you're supposed to do when it happens. However, if some other exception was caught, you're going into the same catch, which says, hey, there was an exception. Perfect. Let's do this particular action we were instructed to do, and that's it. However, in this case, your code might have only expected a certain exception to happen, but not the other one. If the other one happens, then you should actually raise a bug. You should actually have the test uh, tell you, hey, there is a problem here. So make sure you don't uh, you don't use, for example, catch exception when you have you know, other exceptions that might come up uh, apart from the one you, you expected. And make sure to just consider what, what is the behavior in both cases, right? Similarly with the if and else. For example, if you have an if, always consider what happens when the if or when the code in the if doesn't occur. So if you have an if and you expect the if to happen, that's great. But what if that doesn't happen? Is that a bug or is it something we don't really care about? Always consider this part. Always try to also add the else or to at least think about, okay, is the else impacting uh, the, the presence or is it highlighting properly the presence or the absence of a bug or not? Is it something we should consider? Many times it is, and especially if uh, if you have something like if in an if in an if in an if, you know what I mean. So very like nested ifs. Um, many, many ifs without all the corresponding else's can lead to a very easy way of not uncovering any bugs when they're actually present in the software you're testing. And always understand what code you are using, whether you're using an internal utility code or a code from another library, make sure you know exactly what uh, th that code is doing. Because sometimes, for example, you are using a method, uh, again, I'm talking about Java, but you know it can be a function uh, that has a certain name. For example, is displayed, right? This is in Selenium. Uh, just by looking, looking at the name of the method, you would say, oh, it's going to return a Boolean, either true or false, right? And it does return to or, true or false, but it can also return an exception. And most of the cases uh, where, you know, when the, the element is not displayed on the page, it's going to throw you an exception, not return a Boolean, right? So you need to know that this is going to happen in order to properly use that code, which you have taken from a different um, place, code which was probably not written by you. Always understand what it does and always understand whether it actually performs any checks. Because as I said, you always need to perform your checks. Make sure if it's doing, let's say, a larger chunk of work, like submitting a page, it has the corresponding uh, checks attached. And always try to debug an issue if um, your tests are failing and you don't know why. Sorry. <coughs> Isolate only the required uh, test steps so that you don't do a, a huge action in order to try to debug. Add breakpoints and just you know go from breakpoint to breakpoint. Evaluate variables. 
So you have the option in debug to take a variable and assign it different values just to see what happens. Uh, also attempt different actions. For example, if you have a case where a web element is not found on the page by your test, while you're in debug, you can actually create the selectors and try to identify them in your debugging process. Sorry. So always try to evaluate as much as you can while in debug. Because when you're doing debugging, you can control the page that you're testing, right? So you can attempt different actions there, and it's easy for you to see the outcome of every action. You don't have to just run the test, wait for it to finish, try to understand what it was doing, and so on. You can actually control the test run from the debugging uh, process that you're doing. And if, it's, and if it's very difficult for you to debug, or if you just cannot do it, try to do a lot of printouts to the console to identify you know, where you are in the code run. For example, sometimes it's not very obvious that you were going to an, a certain if in the if and if and if and if and so on. So if you're doing some system outs, you can actually say, hey, I'm in the third if, or I'm in that if where I don't know what happened. So kind of try to um, have some hints and clues regarding what the test is doing and where the test uh, or which steps the test has already taken uh, before the test failed, right? So give, give yourself as much information as you can. But debugging usually is the best way to go about it because you have so much control over what is going on there and you can try different things and see the output of those things directly, right? This is easy, for example, um, when you don't have, um, you, you have a selector for a web element and you're pretty sure it's correct and you, you're pretty sure uh, the element is there on the page. If you're doing this debugging, you can actually, for example, uh, identify the fact that it's actually in an iframe because you're trying the selector, you see the exception, but then you're trying to switch to a frame and then you're trying the selector again and then you're like, yeah, okay, it was in a frame. So this is the step that I actually needed to add in the test itself. And always try or, or not try, always make sure you have code reviews on the code that you're writing. Uh, every person who, who takes a look at the code can come up with some additional uh, useful tips uh, to improve the test, for example, or just to let you know, you know, maybe some reasons for, for your code not behaving properly. And apart from that, before you're doing the code reviews, you should do your own code inspections. And there's quite a few tools for, for doing these inspections. And one of the best ones is the one embedded in your IntelliJ, because if you're running uh, or creating your tests with IntelliJ, you can uh, up, um, do an inspection on the code before you're actually committing the code. So it can point out all kinds of uh, issues for um, Java, for example, like all kinds of um, you know, uh, improper use, for example, of the language or some improvements that you can do to the code and so on and so on. So make sure you, you do reviews to get a second opinion and do code inspections for like an automatic uh, review and uh, for, for receiving hints on what you can uh, update. And if you have some other colleagues which are helping you debug the code that you wrote, make sure you are uh, giving them the latest code to do the, the debug on. Always commit the latest changes uh, to make sure that you and they have the same code before they start debugging uh, the, the same code. I've had situations, for example, I've had one situation where a colleague was having an issue with the test. Uh, he said, oh, there is an error here. And when I ran the test, I wasted an hour trying to get to the error he was telling me uh, about. Uh, he said, oh, no, no, I commented this particular line. Comment the line out, another issue. I told him after an hour that I just cannot get to the, the issue he was reporting. And that was because he had more changes on his machine that I didn't have. So I wasn't able to actually reproduce his issue because we weren't looking at the same code. So whenever you're, you know, you, you have other colleagues helping out, make sure you're looking at the same code uh, in, order to, in order to actually identify the, the source of the problem. And always run the tests on the schedule. You have CI pipelines, run the tests you created as much as you can, daily, nightly, and so on because that's going to help you quickly identify any issues that you have in your software. And from time to time, try to run your tests on your own machine, because that's going to help you see if you know, there's something, for example, on the page that you didn't realize that was introduced. Maybe you need to add some extra steps in your tests. Or maybe by looking at the test, as I said, you might pick up on some errors that are not very obvious 
that you didn't have any checks for uh, in your test, and you can add those checks uh, if you if you run these tests. And running the test from time to time means you're actually going to run them under different um, environment conditions, let's say, because there might be some deployments going on in the in the meantime. And if those deployments somehow affect the product, by running these tests several times, you can actually uh, pick up on the, the problems really fast and report any bugs that might, uh, might occur. And don't just retry your tests. Always fix those failing tests or those flaky tests, because if you don't, these tests are just going to be considered irrelevant. Every time the same test is going to fail, people will just ignore the test because they will say, oh yeah, it's that test that always randomly fails, even though it might, in some cases, it might fail for a different reason than that uh, random failing reason that always happens, right? It might actually fail for a very good reason, but because it has a bad history, people will just not look at it anymore. So it's going to miss, you're going to miss out on some bugs because of that. And of course, the test will not be able to be part of a CI CD pipeline if it randomly fails. So you don't want that. You want reliable tests and you want tests that you can count on to, up, uh, to, to validate your, your software. And you can fix a bad test at any time. Anytime you find that there is an issue with the test, just fix it. Create Jira items to fix the tests or to update the tests. Um, and just you know, set aside some time for them, especially if they're testing a feature that is very important. Don't leave bad or unreliable code in the project because somebody else might use it in the future. So you're just going to propagate some bad behavior uh, into the tests that, that somebody else is writing. And just two, two tips for less maintenance, try to use CSS selectors because they are less dependent on the, the HTML structure. So if the HTML changes, you don't need to make so many updates to the CSS and try to extract repeating code into methods, use param parameters there obviously to, to cover more scenarios. And this way, when you do update, uh, when you have to update a particular part of code, you just go into the method, update it, that one, and all of the tests using that code are going to, to get the changes at once. So that was me. Uh, thank you so much. I hope I didn't bore you very much. And uh, let's see if we have anything in the Q&A. There's a question yeah. from Charlie Pradeep. Yes. OK, so what if two buttons with same properties are available in different screens? And how to make a check whether the button is clicked first screen. Uh, so again, two buttons with the same properties and how to make a check. Yeah, we will have to take a look at the scenario. There is a, there is a, a way to do it, but we'll just have to, to see. Uh, we can discuss this in the Hangouts. Maybe you have a bit more, um, more clear example, you know? Okay, what is the ideal time to wait for an element? Anytime. So um, by the way, um, there is a library I created, it's called Waiter. Uh, it's in my repository. So after you will receive the slides, if you go to my GitHub project, you can look up the Waiter uh, library and you can see a few examples of wait methods I have there. You can wait, for example, for an element. So basically your wait can be something like, only exit the wait successfully when the click happened on a button. For example, sorry. Only exit the wait method if you manage to scroll to a particular element and so on and so on. There are different wait methods for different actions. Uh, wait for uh, the correct value to be selected from a dropdown, for example. That means you can, first of all, wait for the dropdown to be there. Then you can perform the actions with the dropdown, like selecting the values. Then you can, again, tab out to, to focus to another um, element and make sure when you focus out the, the same value that you selected is still present in the wait. So, there's a lot of weights you can create. It all depends on the, um, the code that you are testing and on the, the, the scenarios you are trying to cover. Okay, uh, we would go ahead with Gaurav's question in Q&A section. Uh, yes, so any experience to share with devs writing end-to-end -end tests? How do you encourage them and provide them guide, guidance? I don't, <laughs> I, I have a, a kind of a, a, bad, a worse experience with developers writing tests, meaning uh, there's one particular case where I asked the developer to, to write 10 scenarios. Uh, he automated only nine and I was doing a demo and I demoed that single one for which we didn't have automation and it was failing and you know explained that in the demo to the, the uh, stakeholders. Uh, it's a bit more, more challenging. 
Um, usually, I prefer testers to write automation for what the developers are doing from two perspectives. The developer has a certain understanding of the requirements. If they are wrong about it, they need somebody to validate that, somebody who is not them, right? Otherwise, they are testing this with the same misconception with which they implemented the feature. So they might not necessarily implement what was the correct requirement. Secondly, they don't have the same understanding of the product or the same vision, let's say, of the product, uh, I, like the testers. If you do want your devs to, to write automation, you need to sit down with them. You need to, to walk them through the demo a little bit. They need to understand more about the product. And obviously, you can just pr present to them the, the scenarios that they need to test. And whenever they have questions, they should be... Um, they should feel at ease coming to you and asking for your guidance in case uh, there is something wrong. So it's all about communication. You know, if if they do want to do that, and if that's something you want to, to have them do, make sure you're, there's constant communication and there is constant review of what they are doing because code reviews are going to validate whether they're actually testing the, the thing that you wanted them to test. Okay, so I hope that, that answers the question. Thanks, Peep, for the insightful talk. And yeah, this would really be helpful in our daily lives.